Okay. Okay, well, thank thanks to everyone for coming tonight. We're so happy to have all the parents and all the team. Um, and this is our last parent support meeting of the school year. Uh, Julia, welcome to Paris. Uh, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> um, I met Julia, we just decided it was in 1998. So that was a while ago. And we were doing our Montessori training together in Montreal. We spent countless hours commuting uh, between Montreal and Massachusetts. And we talked about everything under the sun. And of course, we talked a lot about Montessori. Uh, Julie has been sharing her knowledge of Dr. Montessori's pedagogy and neuroscience around the world um, by Zoom in, in, um, in person. Uh, it's been very exciting to watch her career. Uh, Julia is dedicated. Uh, she's funny, um, always upbeat, and just an incredible person. So welcome, Julia. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us tonight. Well, I'm so happy to be here, Susan. It's always great to have time with you. And uh, thank you for everybody for showing up. It's really great. So we are going to talk about neurodevelopment in Montessori. We're going to talk about when I'm already talking too fast, aren't I? We're going to talk um, about uh, what happens in the brain during development and how Montessori programs influence that and how that also uh, happens at home and what we do to support that all. So first, I'll just let me get on the screen here. I'll tell you a little bit about me. Um, I'm a mom. I have one child by birth, one child by adoption. Uh, I'm a wife. Um, my husband is a biochemist, so we torture our children at the dinner table with science talk, which is a lot of fun. Um, and we have a dog, which he loves more than he loves me. That's Apple. Um, I earned my Montessori teaching degree with Susan in Montreal, um, a bilingual program. My French is a little pathetic at this point, but um, I can try if I need to. And if you need to ask a question in French, I'll probably understand, but Susan can help me if I do. I'm a Montessori primary guide. I'm also now, I work a lot with grownups, um, teacher mentor. This is a program I did in Memphis. And I, it's one of my many jobs. I'm also a scientist. <laughs> oh, cuckoo. If you could Bonjour. mute yourself, that'd be great. I know. Hello. Thank you for coming. Um, being, uh, so I'm also, uh, I run Matri Learning. Uh, and I am faculty on the Brain Health Initiative, and I'm a guest lecturer at Harvard. I'm also might be sporting a course at Loyola, Loyola this fall on the science of reading. So I love science, and my graduate research at Harvard was on the movable alphabet, and it won the Dean's Prize. And that's not to say I'm so great. It's to say that movable alphabet Montessori work was studied at Harvard, and it won the Dean's Prize. It's good work. So Montessori is getting more and more attention in the research field. So who are you? Can you raise your hand for me if you have one or two children? Just raise, you can this way or the icon, one or two. Okay, raise your hand if you have three or four. Anybody have three or four? No. Okay, so nobody has five or more. <laughs> okay, all right, so we're all small families. Okay, all right, cool. Um, oops. Do you have an infant at home? Anybody have an infant at home? No hands. All right, preschoolers. Preschoolers at home? All elementary. Yeah, elementary. Okay. All right, elementary age children. Okay. Now I know who you are. Does anybody speak two languages at home? Anybody? Yeah, we have Eric. We have Petra. Anybody else? You're all French at home. Or what? What language, if not French at home, what's the language you speak at home if it's not French? Anyone speaking something else? No. Uh, por okay. Portuguese, Portuguese and English. Portuguese and English, three languages. Okay, Eric's children are gonna have the strongest neural networks, just so you know, because the more languages we get when we're little, the more diverse uh, our brain topography becomes. It's really cool. So anybody uh, here went to a traditional school when they were kids? Did you all go to traditional, like the regular French school? Yeah, most of us. Anybody go to an alternative school like Montessori when they were little? My hand is, I want to lower my hand. 
Um, hold on, I don't know why my hand is raised. Oh, that's why. Sorry, okay. It recognized my gesture and automatically raised my hand for me. It's kind of like big brother. Okay, okay. So anyway, the, it's fun to get to know each other a little bit more. And the reason is because um, relationships and emotions and inspiration are actually really important for learning. And this is some research by um, a colleague of mine, Mary Helen Imordino Yang. Um, and she looked at stories of inspiration. And when we're actually inspired and excited and interested in something and connecting with someone, we use more brain real estate, that we have access to more brain real estate than we do in other situations. So this inspiration is really important for learning. And so I'll tell you a short story about a boy in my class, Timothy, when my daughter Devin was in my class, she was little. And um, Timothy had just arrived from China and he only spoke Chinese. He came to school and he was not happy to be there. He did not understand what was going on and he cried so much. For days he cried. I learned a few uh, phrases in Chinese, which I taught my daughter who was in the class. And I would just say them to him to try and calm him a little bit. Wasn't working very well. But one day he was settled enough and he was working with some material on a table. And my daughter was sitting at the table opposite of him. And so she was working with something and she said to him, Ni hao ma, it's like hello in Chinese. And he said, Ni hao ma. And she goes, Wo hang ha? And he goes, Wo hang ha. And she goes, She she. And he goes, She she. And then she goes, Don't copy me. And Timothy says in English, Don't copy me, just like that. And those are his first words in English. And everybody was like, oh, Timothy, you just spoke English. We were so excited. We had like a little parade around the class. And then the world opened up for Timothy. Because he had this moment of connection and relationship and realizing his own capacity, everything improved and he really started to excel in the class. So never underestimate this importance of connection for all of us. Now we're gonna to talk today a little bit about optimal development in the brain and how that's connected with Montessori. Now, the, don't be, uh, many of you are probably have studied science. Anybody studied science? Anybody scientists? We have, oh, we have a couple. Okay, cool. So good. You keep me on my toes. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the foundations of development here, optimal development. It's a combination of our genes and our environment, okay? And our genes, we're not stuck with our genes. We have the genes we have, but our genes are turning off on and all, on and off all the time based on our environment, based on our experiences. So our environment really influences that. And then includes our social relationships and how we adapt to our culture. My brain growing up in America looks different from um, your brain, Manuel, growing up in France. I'm assuming you grew up in France. And it's because of our cultural uh, ways of being, you know, speaking with our hands, not speaking with our hands, standing close, standing back, understanding when to jump in and when to pause. That physically changes the structure of our brain. And Dr. Montessori called that adaptation, how we change. Also, our interests and the sensitive periods that we go through for when our brain wants to do certain things. This affects our development. And finally, opportunity and practice. So what we actually do again and again is shaping our brain because the brain is always learning. So right now, your brain is going to be different from it is an hour from now. Okay? Your brain is different now than it was an hour ago. The brain is always learning. That's what it does and constantly changing. And this is obvious when you think about the baby brain. Right over here on the left, you've got this little brain. When they're born, the head is smaller. All the women say yay. And then this bigger brain as we grow, right? It gets bigger because it physically changes. So we're not stuck with one brain when we're born. And how the brain grows is because both of our genetics, our biology, but also the experiences we have in the world, okay? And experiences include our social interactions. All right, sometimes you forget that. Now, here's an example. I love this picture of Otto and Ewald, identical twins. And you can see physically their form looks quite different because, you know, Ewald, he's beefy, right? He's pumping it up and Otto, not so much. Our brain is the same way. The more we do things, parts of our brain will get stronger. Other parts will not be as developed, okay? So our brain works the same way. So this is because of how we're growing and pruning connections in the brain. So those of you who've had biology, you probably had this in high school, you might remember. These little black circles are the cell bodies of the neuron, also called the soma. And these long skinny lines 
These long, long ones are the axons and the little ones down here are the dendrites. Those are the connections, okay? So we have cell body and we have connection. Now here, this is a newborn brain, very sparse. And you can see things are changing at one month, at six months, and then at two years, it's crowded. Do you see that it's not the number of cell bodies that's changed, but what's changed? It's the number of connections, right? So we're not growing new neurons mostly. We have most of the neurons we'll have at birth, about 87 billion, plus or minus 8 billion, okay? Like I could have 8 billion less than you, and that's okay, okay? So it's all about connections in the brain. Now these overcrowded connections are actually inefficient. And you think of it this way, you're starting down here at point A and you've got to get to point B. Well, how are you going to get there? It's like you got to hack your way through this, you know, jungle with the machete to get through this tangle. There's not a clear path. So this is why it takes children forever to do anything, right? They're starting over here and then they've got to go over here and over here and over here, right? It's the same thing. This is physically what's happening in the brain when they do that. And that's why it takes them so long to do anything. It's not a problem. It's just the way the brain is designed. And these underused connections are pruned away with experience. So here we are at birth, very sparse. Age seven, very crowded. And then age 15, can you see the difference? It's a little more space. There's fewer connections there. So is that like what happens when they're teenagers? Like they lose all their connections, right? That's why they're crazy. No, it's good. It's pruning. It makes it more efficient. And you can think of it this way. We're starting in this sparse desert and we're switching into like a wooded, a wooded trail. And then we turn it into a super highway. So the super highway is much more efficient. That makes sense so much. The connections are also more reinforced there. It says, yes. And it's exactly what happens at the synaptic level, that space between the neurons, you get uh, up to up regulation of receptor sites. And you also get more branching. Those are two of the key ways that you get stronger connections there. Yeah, I knew there, the scientist in the group, he's not going to let me slack at all. That's very good. I'm glad. Okay, so we, rec we create our brain's physical structure whenever we do something repeatedly. All right. And this is just a 3D print of what our myelinated axons can look like. Okay. And that's called the white matter because it's actually white. The white part. Myelin, just so you know, is not uh, just fat. It's a living cell called an oligodendrocyte. You can impress your friends by saying oligodendrocyte is what myelin really is. And it's a living cell. And our nutrition, what we eat, actually is really important for helping that living cell grow. So use it or lose it is uh, what's happening in the brain. We're going to prune these connections or we're not going to refine them. Okay. And Dr. Montessori knew that. She said every unnecessary aid is an obstacle to development. So what does that mean? In the Montessori classroom, we show the child how to do something, we give them a presentation or a lesson, and then we let them do it. We pause, we fade, we observe, and let them do it. And then we only step in if it's really necessary. We try to let them have the experience. We might represent it another time if they need to see it again. And that's because it's the child's work that makes their brain. A lot of us adults, we're like, you know, jumping in, like, come on, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, and try to get them to finish it and do it right. It's actually not what needs to happen. We have a lot of experience. We already know how to tie our shoes. They need to practice tying their own shoes, right, so that they can get those strong connections. And in neuroscience, we say practice makes permanent. Is everybody following me so far? Yeah, Veronique, Jessica, Manuel, we're good? You're all keeping up. Okay. My, my English isn't too fast. Okay. Feel free to chime in if I am. Um, Julia? So, have, yeah. Uh, if, we, if we have a question that comes up in the, um, the chat, do you want to talk about that right now or do you want to wait? Yeah, either way. I mean, I did answer Eric. So yeah, just put it right in the chat and we'll get to it as soon as it makes sense. Okay, well, on... yeah. It was Eric, maybe that I'm just seeing it it's, now. Yeah, I got it. Right. So thanks. yeah. Put it right in or unmute and ask. So we do need to engage in the world to build our strong brains. And so our passive lives, like this child who's all, you know, constrained and not going to build strong connections. If we're always scrolling, not so much with the strong connections, right? Although maybe you want to see kitten videos sometimes to cheer you up, but mostly the scrolling less active, okay? Um, active is what we want for strong networks. All right, here's a quiz. Are you guys ready? We're born with most of the neurons we'll have. True or false? 
Are you paying attention? Let's see, true or false? You can say true, you can type it in the chat. You wanna say, we've got a, what's that? <laughs> is that like the Greek symbol for true? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> the answer is true. We are born with most of the neurons we'll ever have, about 86 billion, plus or minus 8 billion. Okay, so you have tons of neurons in your brain right now that you've had your whole life. Anything we do repeatedly, the brain learns to do more efficiently. True or false? What do you think? I just got it. You got a thumbs up. Anybody else? We're thinking thumbs up, Manuel. Thumbs up. True. The answer is true. That's anything we do repeatedly. So like if we get stressed out and we're doing yoga and meditating, our brain gets very efficient at looking to that as to soothe our stress. But if we always eat the cookie, like I'm a cookie person, like it, that's not so, our brain is going to get very efficient at wanting the cookie to make us feel better when we're stressed out. So anything we do repeatedly, all right? So must just be mindful of that. All right, as you master a skill, the brain becomes more efficient at using that skill. This is super, super interesting. So look at this brain. This is the areas that a child is using when they're 11 and they're reading. And you think 11, they're pretty good readers, right? At 11, you can read chapter books and everything. Okay, and but here at 38, this is what the brain uses when they're 38, a lot less. Okay, because it has refined, stronger, longer connections than the young child, than the younger child. So just remember this, when we're doing something, it takes us very little cognitive load, whereas it takes the young child a lot more brain effort, a lot more brain energy to do the same thing that we're doing. And this is why in the Montessori classroom, we give the children time to focus on what they need to do and do it at their own pace because it takes them longer. When you're in traditional schools, Many of us were in traditional schools and we remember there's not a lot of time freedom. You know, it's all based on 20 minutes, you know, this, 20 minutes, that. It doesn't allow for this optimal development in the same way. So, okay. Regression is a predictable part of learning. This is so fun. Okay, okay, okay. So you're here right now and maybe you haven't uh, learned about neuroscience before, thought about it in this way. And you're learning now and you're down here at the bottom, okay? This is what you're learning now. And you're learning, oh, myelin is an oligodendrocyte and we create our brain based on anything we do repeatedly, right? And our brain is always changing. Okay, so you're down here. Now you're up here because you have all that little knowledge. Okay, after the call, you're talking to your spouse, right? And you like, they're like, what did you talk about? We're like, well, it was about the brain. It was really cool. And like, you forget like the details, okay? But maybe tomorrow, right? You'll talk to somebody else and you'll be reminded or you'll watch the video and you'll be reminded and your learning is reconstructed. It falls apart, you reconstruct it. It falls apart, you reconstruct it on the road to mastery all the time. So it's predictable that we have regressions <clears throat> in our learning. It's predictable that our knowledge falls apart a little bit and then we rebuild it. And it's that process of repeatedly rebuilding our knowledge that we really come to master topic. And in Montessori, that's what we're doing, constantly repeating, repeating, repeating until the children achieve mastery, repeating as much as they need to or as little as they need to because we're all different. We don't need the same amount. Does that make sense to everybody with repetition and scaffolds? Now, this is like scaffolding means some support to help you with learning. And for tonight, you know, watching the video or speaking with some people who are here tomorrow about these topics, um, that's a scaffold, that's a support. If we were to test you without those supports in place, you would test lower at this functional level. So that's where most standard tests are testing people down at this functional level. But in the Montessori environment, we're observing and we can witness these dynamic changes because the Montessori classroom is a whole scaffold. The whole Montessori environment is reminding us and supporting us about what we're learning. And you can look here on the math shelves, thousands are bigger than hundreds right? Hundreds are bigger than tens. Tens are bigger than units. Physically scaffolding our knowledge. Does that make sense to everybody that we have these supports for learning? Okay, thank you for nodding. And we also have time for learning and processing time is really important for memory consolidation. I'll tell you the story of this little mouse, okay? Here's this little mouse. They put a little cap on him in a maze and the mouse is going from point A to point B to point C to point D. So he goes to point A, and little, you know, areas for point A light up in the brain. It goes to point B, point B lights up, point C, point C lights up. 
Point D, he gets there. He pauses. He scratches. He sniffs. Points D, C, D, and A light up. So it's during the pause that we actually put all the information together so that it makes sense. We consolidate it. Okay? So this is why pausing is so important for all of us, um, not just for our children, but to pause and notice um, what we've just learned to take a moment and reflect and sleep is actually super important for that too, um, getting uh, plenty of sleep. And so I love this picture from your website, Rue Papin, um, of these people out in nature, children out in nature. And that's one of the ways pausing for each of us and for our children, being outside without a screen, just pausing and noticing the world, super, super yummy juice for the brain that makes. Okay, so there's the pause. All right, now learning is easier when we're younger, but we're never too old. So if you're I'm in my 50s, right? So don't be discouraged as you get older, you can still learn. Um, and that's about plasticity. So when we're younger, the brain kind of effortlessly learns. It's called effortless plasticity. Plasticity means the capacity of the brain to learn. And so across the bottom of this graph here, you see age going across the bottom from birth to 70. And then up here is the amount of plasticity. Now there's two kinds of plasticity. There's effortless, which is like the absorbent mind. It just, you know, your brain just sucks it in without working too hard. And then there's effortful, which means we have to try, we have to study, we have to repeat things and do things again and again to get better at it. As we're little, we have all this effortless plasticity. So the brain is just taking it in so easily and then changing our neural networks as a result of it. As we get older, we still have plasticity, but we have to work harder to do what was effortless for the young child to do, okay? So it's never too, you're never too old to learn, okay? So don't let anybody say, oh, I'm old, I'm forgetful. That's a bunch of baloney. You can do it and you just might have to work a little harder. Is that encouraging for anybody? You all look very young and fit. Maybe this isn't pressing for you, but for me, this is encouraging. Okay, all right. Strong executive functions follow a similar curve of development where a lot is happening early on. Let me just tell you what they are. So first, executive functions are the things, um, the foundations for executive function that happen in early childhood or the development of working memory. That's the ability to keep track of things in your mind. Like if you have a shopping list, um, but you don't write it down, you know, you just have to remember later, okay, I had to get eggs and milk and bread and okay, baguette. Uh, okay, so that's working memory, keeping track of things and using it later. Inhibitory control is when we learn how to regulate ourselves. It's like self-regulation. So we don't do the, the unskillful thing, like, you know, we won't yell at our boss if they yell at us, right? Even though we might want to, that's inhibitory control. We don't eat the third cookie, right? That's inhibitory control. I'm working on the third cookie. That's my issue. But children, they're developing this self-regulation. So it's emotional regulation, right? And our ability to choose which uh, emotional responses we're going to engage with, which um, desires we'll follow through on. And then there's also cognitive flexibility. And that's the ability to think um, from a different perspective, right? And to think, oh, they might find it. They think it'll be easier if we do it this way. So, okay, right? And like with the little children, they're like, oh, it's time to go. And they're like, it's not time to go. And they can't move their mindset, right? So easily they kind of get stuck. You'll be like, right, going out the door. And they'll be like, oh no, I'm working on something else. And they're not as easily ready to switch, not as flexible. And that develops with age. Altogether, these help contribute to our ability to plan, to problem solve, and to think reasonably. All right, y'all with me on these foundations of executive function? You're there? Okay, thank you. All right, so when are these developing? They're actually, most of them, if you look at this graph, like our other graph, we have executive function skill proficiency going up here on the left. And then we have age going across the bottom. And look at this, boom, there's this huge development of executive functions in the first uh, ages three to six. Huge boom, okay? And once they're developing, it means you're having these crazy connections proliferating, growing, growing, growing. They're not refined yet, but we're laying the foundation for future. You have to have this overgrowth of connections so you can refine them later. Lots of experiences, lots of hands-on, okay? And then there's another bump you'll see around adolescence. So my son is 17. He's there. And I just want to point out that I'm 
below him. Okay. But that's, that's, don't be too depressed, right? If you have a teenager. Okay. They're proliferating. They haven't refined it all yet. Okay. But it's the huge time for growth, exponential growth in executive function. So why does this matter? Because in the Montessori classroom, we're giving the children choices, right? Choices. And it's through these choices that they learn to develop them because you need practice. You have, your brain has to do things repeatedly to get good at it. Okay. So we're, when they're littler, we're saying, you, you know, do you want to wear the red shirt or the blue shirt? Right. When they're older, we say, you know, um, uh, do you want to do, make your bed first or do you want to put your dishes away first? You know, we're giving them choices around things that they have to do. We're not saying they don't have to do them, but we let them choose as much as possible. That, are you guys with me on executive functions and choices? Is that okay? All right, thank you, Eric. There is research, just so you know, from Angeline Lillard um, uh, on how Montessori classrooms support executive function development. And she was looking at different, um, these are different executive function tests that they did with these groups of children who were either in classical Montessori schools, supplemented Montessori, which is kind of like wishy-washy Montessori, uh, or conventional. Uh, traditional schools. Uh, Rupapin is classic Montessori. So they're getting this best, best gains from spring to fall based on these different tests of executive function. So there's, um, you're very fortunate to be in such a great school. You really are because of the, the benefits it's giving your children's brain development. Also, kids who are more active have more brain power and better executive functions, literally. Um, it increases activity, physical activity in children increases their brain size in the areas responsible for cognitive flexibility, one of those executive function foundations, reinforcement learning and motivation, and also memory, right? So that's what we want. Normalization is a Montessori term that means children are developing typically. They're in a skillful, supported, quote unquote, normal developmental path, okay? All right, so that's normalization and that's executive function. Now these movement areas are intrinsically connected to our thinking region. So I, I'm standing up right now. So I think most of you are probably sitting down and though no, Chen Yu is walking, yes. And because this is actually really huge. Movement and thinking go hand in hand and you wouldn't expect that, right? But every time we move, right? Even if you just stood up right now, you would give a little spurt of this thing called brain derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. And it's like yummy juice for the brain. It, the brain loves it and it really helps um, the brain function optimally. And that's through movement and gets that. And that is connected with our thinking speed, with our ability to go fast. And all this bilingualism your children are getting at Le Papin, it's connected with their movement networks and it's connected with their long-term intelligence. So they have a, a delayed onset of dementia if you're bilingual, especially from a young age. So bilingualism is just a huge benefit to the developing brain. Does anybody have questions about bilingualism? Is that going okay for everybody? Here I am speaking all in English and half of you, this is not your first language, so it can't be that bad or you just totally don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> but anyway, okay. Anyway, movement, key, 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 key. So as much as you can, um, not have your child, you don't have, your children aren't so young in this group, but not in the stroller. They're walking, right? They're not they're not riding. As much as you can, get them exercise. Take the stairs, don't take the elevator. All of those things, little tricks. Um, movement is key for brain development, super, for the kids and for us to keep us healthy longer. And in the Montessori environment, they have to move all the time, right? They just, there's, you don't see desks, right? There are tables, but they're up, they're down, they're up, they're down, like little whack-a-mole. Do you have whack-a-mole in France? It's this game where you're, anyway, it's a game. And it's, it's funny, up and down, up and down all the time, like gophers, okay. Now freedom with limits helps executive function. So we say that the child needs to be free to choose their own activity, to choose what they're gonna work on. And this requires some knowledge on how to use what it is they're using, right? So they're not doing something totally goofy, like using, you know, our, our building, our red rods we have in the classroom, these long rods, they can't be used as lightsabers, no, right? They have to be used intelligently. Um, they have to work, be free to work at their own pace, and they have to be free to repeat as much as they need to repeat, okay? So these freedoms, but what they're not free to do is to do anything dangerous, destructive, or demeaning, 
right? And that's when the adults are help, stepping in to redirect the behavior, okay? I wanna to talk to you for a second about this because this is about the stress response. These three Ds, dangerous, destructive, demeaning, they trigger, in many people, they trigger an acute stress response. And if you witness it happening, you know, you feel yourself go ah, a little bit like this. Now, a little stress is good, right? Like if we're working out, we're getting stronger, our muscles get bigger, we need to stress them a little bit so they can get stronger. And so sometimes work and schoolwork and learning is challenging. That's not bad stress. That's good stress. That's important. And it helps us persist, overcome and get past it and master something. There's other kinds of stress. Acute stress is different. So typically our brain, everybody up here in the front of your brain, when you're paying attention, things are making sense, right? You have a lot of activity up here. It's called the prefrontal cortex, prefrontal cortex. And that's moderate neurotransmitter leaf release. Things are moving along swimmingly. Like I hopefully everybody right now is having that. Okay, but let's say your boss walks in. Susan's not like this, but somebody walks in your mom, right? Or somebody and they yell at you, your spouse, they yell at you, okay? Ah, okay, what happens? Like right away, like, ah, like you feel like a change, right? And that literally is that feeling of that, I think, this prefrontal cortex activity moving into your limbic system, right? The energy moves, it changes, okay? So we don't have access to our higher thinking areas when we have a stress response. We get this burst of neurotransmitter release, and it's really, really tricky. I'll get to the exam question. Great question. Okay. So what do we do in this moment? If we've just triggered somehow we've been triggered or we triggered an acute stress response in somebody, then what do we do? Like half the time we're like, and what are you going to do about it next time? How are you going to fix it? Right. And what do you say? You're like, uh, I don't know. Something comes out of your mouth, right? Maybe it's intelligent. Maybe it's not, but it's not your best possible response because this is not a learning moment. So these stress responses are huge, huge, huge um, challenges for learning. And that's why there's so many things in the Montessori environment that avoid stress responses. Like our work is self-correcting. When there are errors, the materials are built so that the children can find their own errors. They don't need an adult to point out the errors. And we want the environment to be that way as much as possible. Now, if you have a friend, like if Susan tells me, uh, Julia, you're totally messing up, She's my friend. It's not going to freak me out. I'll be like, oh, thanks, Susan. You're saving me. But if, it, if it's an authority figure, it feels very different. So when children correct or friends correct each other, it doesn't cause this stress response. But when we adults or authority figures do this correction, very difficult for the brain if it triggers a stress response. Now, not all of us get a stress response triggered for the same thing, right? It's different for each of us. I have a different thing that will trigger me more than you. Okay, and that's normal also. So as adults, we have to really be mindful of the possibility of accidentally triggering these stress responses. It's not gonna be helpful for the brain. It's not gonna be helpful for learning and certainly not a teachable moment. And I know many of us grew up in situations where it was just the opposite, right? We were just always corrected, right? Not the best thing for learning. Now, there, you obviously have to, if it's dangerous, destructive, or demeaning, you don't let kids run into the street and get hurt, you know, you don't let them use drugs, you absolutely step in and, and redirect them to the skillful behavior, okay? But avoiding acute stress responses for anything that's not those three Ds, you really want to pause and observe and take it slow. Now, the question is about exam stress, is that good or bad? And I'm going to ask you what you think. Tell me a little bit more about that. Who is this? Is Cohen? I don't see Colin. Can you can you unmute and tell us more what you're thinking about Colin? Yes. Hi, this is Frederick. Um, yes, Frederick. probably it's a, it's a bad stress, isn't it? No, I can I can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, I, I just said that uh, it's probably a bad stress for the kids. A bad stress. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. It's true. And, and just think about it from your own perspective. Many of us have had big exams that we've had to take, right? Sometimes those have been actually helpful for us, haven't they? Because they've pushed us a little bit and we've been like, okay, I can do this and we've succeeded. So it depends on the amount that we're experiencing and the, the child's view and the culture's view. But when it's perpetual exam, 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 that can really be overwhelming because it's building up and it's exceeding our capacity, right? It depends on how much, if it's one exam, like, you know, we're going to 
sit for the bar in the U.S., they call it when you become a lawyer and you have to pass this big exam. It is a lot of stress, but it really forces you to up your game. That can be you stress. That can be helpful. Really depends on the situation. But if it's just overloaded, constant stress, it can be too much. Is that, Frederick, does that answer the question? And then Eric writes, learning to overcome stress can be more like learning to ride a bike in the street. Ah, interesting, mm -hmm. interesting. So the, um, uh, learning to overcome stress, you don't have to do it all at the same time. You can absolutely learn to work with your triggers and help to mitigate what triggers you. You can, through especially through mindfulness practices, through self-reflective practices, you can help regulate what triggers your stress responses, um, for sure. For the young child, we're trying to help them learn how to work with stress, but better yet, avoid the stress because they want we want a non-toxic um, environment for the brain. Toxic stress is really problematic for brain development. But don't freak out if you. I have an abuse history as a child, and I graduated from Harvard, so it's still possible. Even if you have a tricky childhood, you can still you know work around it and overcome. The brain is incredibly plastic. It depends a lot on what environmental inputs you give it, okay? So, but of course, for our children, we're trying to give them the best possible so they don't have to worry about overcoming. They just have a great foundation. And Montessori is doing that. It's just, it's in its very bones, how it's designed to meet these aspects of brain development that we've been speaking about. Any other things about stress you want to mention or bring up? I know this is tricky for a lot of people in our own lives or with our children, with our colleagues. Right? Okay. I know no one can say anything because Susan's here. She would never cause a stress response. She's very nice. <laughs> okay. One great thing about uh, stress is relationships buffer stress. So if we have strong relationships, and this I think goes to um, Constance's question in the chat. Um, if we have strong relationships, it can be much easier for us to manage stress. And has to do, this is a very complicated graph, I'm not going into it, has to do a little bit with oxytocin, but it's relationships. So when we have good friends, um, when we have supportive family relationships, you know, non-judgmental, but asset-based, positivity-based, uh, we can really weather stress much more skillfully. And when we don't have that, we can be more susceptible to stress. And Constance, I would just say that it really is individual. It depends on the causes and conditions of our life, of the child's life. And it's different from person to person. And that's normal for it to be different. So our job as the adult working with other adults or working with children is to be keen observers and try to be aware of what what will, will and won't work for, for certain people. Okay. And mostly try to just be kind. <laughs> Err on the side of kindness and less judgment. Okay, oh, here's a quiz. Are you ready? Correcting a child when they make a mistake is important for learning. True or false? Correcting a child, this is, oh, this is tricky. Constance is voting down. Okay, anybody else? She's courageous. False, you're correct, Constance. Okay, corrections can lead to an acute stress response which interferes with learning. It's more skillful to wait for a neutral moment and represent the lesson. So represent the lesson. So when you see the child totally mess up with their friend, they're rude, whatever, you want to redirect them, change the focus of the attention. And then later, when they're not in the moment, then you can talk about it and discuss it when everybody's in a calm place. Does that make sense to everybody? It's hard for us sometimes. We're like, no, I got to tell them right now. Wait, hold, hold your horses and wait. Oh, here's another quiz. It requires more brain energy for a child to tie their shoes than for an adult. True or false? True, we see true, I see some truths. Yes, you're right, it's true. They have to get through this tangle of connections to do things that are effortless for us because we have super highways, they have jungles. Okay, all right, adaptation and modeling. Our behavior dramatically affects those around us. And I wanna tell you, just look at these pictures. So here we have, Michelle Obama, look at her children. They're all sitting exactly the same. They're so dignified, upright back, right? Dignified. And then look at the farmers. They're like hanging out and relaxed. The kids are just, just like chilling out. We adapt to our environment, the people, time, and group that surround us. Okay. We are changing and the brain physically changes as a result of that. 
Dr. Montessori said the child reproduces in himself by a form of psychic mimesis, the characteristics of the people in his environment. And in science, we call this cultural neuroscience. And they've done research on brains where you can see the different neural networks that are formed and used um, based on the cultures that we grew up in. Okay, and these mirror neurons are a part of that. So how many have heard of mirror neurons? Has anybody heard of mirror neurons? Not yet, Constance has. Okay, all right, let me tell you what they are. So the, I'll tell you how they discovered them. The scientist is doing an experiment with the monkey and the monkey's not doing what he wants. He's not getting good data. And so he takes a break and he starts eating peanuts, okay? And then the monkey wants the peanut. The monkey's like, you know, going crazy. Like, I want the peanut, I want the peanut. And the researcher being a very, you know, wonderful researcher, is like, I'm not giving you my peanut. And he sticks his tongue out at the monkey, literally sticks his tongue out at the monkey. Okay, the monkey sticks his tongue out back at the researcher. Okay, the monkey is is being monitored. The brain, he's got all these, you know, wires on, on, his, on his cap there. They're watching what's happening. And they discovered that when the monkey saw the researcher stick out his tongue, and when the monkey stuck out his own tongue, the same parts of the brain were active to a lesser degree, but the same parts. So when I perceive you are doing something, my brain experiences it to a lesser degree like I'm doing it. This is how we adapt and absorb the behaviors of our culture, of the people around us. We witness them and our brain is like, zoop, we're doing it too. The brain is along for the ride, okay? The key is what we perceive. So we're not interested when we're inference, we're not interested in dog speech. So we're not perceiving barking as speech. So we're not absorbing that. We're perceiving human speech as speech, right? So we perceive that. That's what we take in. And our body experiences in our brain the same way as the other person experiences. So this is huge, right? I mean, think about television, right? Well, not television. Think about, you know, Netflix and, and screen time and YouTube. What are we watching people do? Are we watching the YouTube where they're, you know, sandblasting all the stuff, the rust away, and it's like, you know, really interesting? Or are we watching, you know, you know, Thor, you know, killing everybody and being this great funny hero, right? These matter a lot for the brain because our brain, again, is experiencing to a lesser degree what we witness in others and the people around us. Now, this is also um, uh, really important for learning because we like to use, especially now we have all these great programs. Like I can learn, I'm learning Polish now. I, I can learn it on my phone, right? I can do all of these little things to learn Polish, right? But it's less effective than when we learn it with someone in person. And I'll show you this research by Patricia Cole, great researcher. She had these infants and they were either, they had this graduate student, same graduate student. She was a native Mandarin speaker and the infants were either native Mandarin speakers or native English speakers. And they would come once a week and have a story read to them by this researcher live, or they would have a video. And they did the same thing with native uh, Mandarin speakers with an English speaking graduate student. Okay, my two confusers that making, I got that for you. They had, they tested the infants and their ability to hear the sounds in the other language. And they found that the infants who had the human exposure, they could hear those sounds in Chinese or in English, even though those sounds aren't in their, the, the language spoken in their home. The children who were uh, looking at the videos, no growth, no change at all. It was as if they'd never had that exposure. So it's this human interaction and just look, look at what is happening. The child is engaged, social interaction with this human, right? So this human interaction is super, super important for learning. And that's why screens can be fun and they can be a support, but the younger we are, the less effective screens are. And even as we're older, they're less effective than, than humans. Can you believe that? Isn't that well? It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. All right, so here's your quiz. When my friend opens a bag of chips, I want to eat them because I have no self-control. My body really needs those chips or my mirror neurons are working. Which one is it? Which one? It's C. That's right, it's C. Okay, when we perceive that something is happening to someone else, our brain becomes activated as if we're experiencing that very thing. So it's the chips, you're, you're eating them. They're in the other room. You're already 
eating them. That's how strong our mirror neurons are. So that's why it matters so much um, what we're modeling for everybody else. Okay. Now we're also biased to notice and remember negative things more than positive things. Have you noticed this about yourself? Like we remember when somebody, you know, when we mess up, we like focus on the things we messed up on more than we focus on the things we've done well. Anybody, is that just an American thing? No, you guys have that experience, right? Okay. This is called our negativity bias. Have you heard of the negativity bias? It's pretty interesting. So it makes sense. Like if you're out and, you know, you encounter this, you know, the tiger is running after you and you're like, oh, every time I'm in this part of the Sierra, the tiger appears. So I'm going to stay away from that. I'm going to pay attention to that, right? Because it matters for your survival. But now we get all of this negative, you know, every time we look at the news, negative, negative, negative. But it's not actually key for our survival, is it? But it feels that way biologically. It feels that way. What we can do is try to nurture our optimism bias. And this is really important for thriving. And so I'll give you an example of how we can reframe our thinking on some things. So here's one. Pessimistic thought. The politician is horrendous. I don't think nobody feels that way in France ever. No, right? Okay. Optimistic alternative. This is our chance to see if the checks and balances in our government really work. Okay. Reframing. All right. He totally has ADHD. You think this about children sometimes, right? Okay, reframe it. His interests are broad. And it's true. They are broad. And actually, ADHD, a lot of entrepreneurs, very successful, rich people have ADHD. Okay. The child is absolutely out of control. I know none of you have ever felt that way about any child because you're all wonderful, wonderful, kind people. An optimi optimistic alternative. The child is just starting to develop his executive functions. He'll get there hopefully soon. Okay, so this act of reframing can be really, really important to help us nurture our optimism bias and to take a positivity focused assets based view of the other humans that we're working with, right? Positivity assets based deficit space doesn't really work so well when we always focus on what people are messing up and what isn't working yet. Um, it's much less effective uh, instructionally. Um, it's not as good for the brain, causes those acute stress responses. And bottom line is it just doesn't work as well, right? So if we want to help people in their growth, um, we need to keep a positivity bias. So here's a little proof that Montessori works. Some people, you probably know this, the founders of Google, Amazon, The Sims, Catherine Graham, editor of the Washington Post forever, Julia Child, right? And Frank Joshua Bell from all walks of life. These were all Montessori children who actually attribute their lifelong success to the fact that they went to Montessori school when they were little. So what you're offering to your children is really, it's setting up their brain for optimal development. And it's really, uh, it's key for the rest of your life. You're using the brain that you have developed uh, in childhood forever, and you can improve it. You can retrain it. You can get more skillful if you had tricky stuff, but it's a heck of a lot easier if you get it developed strong right from the, from the beginning. Okay, so that's what I had uh, to share with you. And if you want to learn more, you can check out any of my websites. I have tons of information there. If you want to geek out with me on my pedagogy blog or on the Brain Health Initiative, we have a lot of resources there as well. And also, I have a, a quick plug for you. Uh, if you would like to participate in any research, um, I have one of the founders of the Montessori Research Pool. We ask anybody, teachers, parents, grandparents, administrators, um, who might be willing to participate in research to sign up. And all you do is fill out a form. It takes no time at all. If a researcher has approval from an ethics board, they could get access to this database. And then they could contact you and say, would you like to be in a study? You could say no. You could say yes. You could say no. But if you're open to it, please, please, please take a picture of this QR code and sign up. It makes a big, big difference. To researchers like me who are trying to do studies. So I, I don't see any cameras. Everybody should be taking pictures. What do I have to do? Okay. Anyway, I won't. I won't pressure you. I have all the re the references um, for this in here as well. If you're geeky and you want to go deeper, you can. Okay. And now we have a few minutes for questions or to talk about anything that came up. I saw people looked like they were interested in some things, stress especially.
Any other questions? You guys don't have any stress in France. I know you're. Go ahead, Constance. You can unmute. Yeah, I had a question about like, um, does research or just the state of knowledge today, today um, gave insights about the fact like, is there is some um, cultural way of learning that is close to Montessori that we could observe in other cultures? Because, you know, it's like education is really Western dominant like spread. Mm -hmm. And so, so the, now that maybe research allows us to have a bit of a general view, uh, could we, like, um, you know, draw a picture about if there is like other way of learning that are really close to Montessori? Mm -hmm. And I, that's a great question, Constance. And I actually wish um, that the Montessori method had never been called the Montessori method because that implies that it's a guru model and it's not a guru model. It's just scientific pedagogy. Mm -hmm. It's just the scientific method applied to human development and to education. So I think Constance, if you use your powers of observation and you look for these things that would support optimal brain development, then you could make that determination, right? Mm -hmm. Are the children free to choose? Are they free to correct their own errors? Are they free to interact with others? Are they free to move, right? Oh, uh, yeah. So those types of things you could look for. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Just unmute if you'd like to ask something. We'll talk more about anything that we've covered. We did a lot. Yeah, I just like you, you've been talking before about sleep and good sleep. And so um, can you please just give us a bit more details about so what it is from your point of view and uh, and also maybe um, also have your your view on food and the influence on food on the on the brain development? Oh, yeah. Thank you oh, very great. much. Great, great question. So sleep, first of all, um, I'll ask you a question. Raise your hand if you had enough sleep last night. Yeah. Oh, we got two people raising. That's more than usual. Three. Okay. Okay. Raise your hand if you get enough sleep in general. Yeah, not a lot of people. Okay. Raise your hand if you know what enough sleep is. There are a few. Okay. So here, enough sleep is when you wake up without an alarm and you feel rested. Okay. Wake up without an alarm and you feel rested. And if you consistently watch yourself over time, you'll know that you've had enough sleep. Now, over development, children uh, need a lot more sleep than adults do, but not all children need as much sleep as we think they need. Like if you're in the elementary years, they may need 12 hours a night or they may need nine hours a night. Depends on the child. So you have to observe your children and see when they wake up refreshed and ready to go and aren't groggy. If they're always groggy in the morning and you're kind of like, get out of bed, get out of bed, you probably need to walk your bedtime back a little bit. Same thing for we adults. Now, one of the best things for sleep, of course, is physical activity. Because if our, if our bodies are, are used well during the day and are very active, then we tend to sleep better at night. Now, nutrition is another part of sleep. And if you have digestive troubles, that can wake you up, it can keep you up, it can pre prevent you from falling asleep, right? Nutrition is so, so key for brain development. And when we talk about nutrition, there's so many different studies that are saying, you need fish oil, you don't need fish oil, you need coffee, you don't need coffee, right? And it's very hard to know what studies to believe. The reason I think for that, that diversity of research is because humans are so variable. We are inherently variable. Now, if I were on the diet that I have celiac disease, I can't eat bread, no baguettes for me, right? If I eat that diet and everyone's like, have some grains in your diet, you need some grains in your diet, I, I would be sick as a dog. So mine is different from what yours is, right? Every one of us is slightly different. In, based on our microbiome, right? What little critters we have living in our guts that are helping us. And generally though, we wanna stay on a more plant-based, the research says plant-based, less processed diets are really helpful. The Mediterranean diet has a lot of good research on it. 
you know, so staying away from processed foods. And there's actually more and more research coming out on processed foods, like sausage and bacon. My husband does not want to hear this. Bacon, very bad. All those processed meats, yeah, very bad. So very tricky for the body because of the preservatives that we put in them. The nitrates are very cancer carcinogenic. Sodium, too much sodium really trick, messes with our vasculature. So nutrition is super, super important. For your children, I would really, to get them eating uh, more healthily, if, if that's something you're working on in your family, involve them in the um, preparation of the food is really key to get them to help making it. When, pe when we are uh, participating in food preparation, we tend to be more interested in the results and more attached to the results. So you may have more luck there. Did I answer your PF? Is that anything else you wanted to Yeah, yeah, it, it, it did. Thank you very much. I just wanted to know if there is like really a link between like uh, food and um, brain, um, I would say, uh, um, cell development or if uh, the food or bad food could essentially uh, heal brain cell. But I think you answered the question. Yeah. Yeah. So much. there absolutely is. So think about the neurotransmitters in the brain, the precursors, what we need to create those neurotransmitters, they come from our food. They come from our diet. So we have to have a diet that's rich in what the brain needs if we want the brain to develop optimally. And that's why when you're eating a more plant-based, less processed diet, you get that. And some foods are not good for brain brain function, right? And again, it's not a, a slam dunk that it's the same for everybody because there's a lot of variability there from human to human. So I know we like to get righteous and say, my mother, you know, she's on this diet. You need this diet. It's the best, you know, and, you know. It's not always that way. It's variability from person to person. Great question. What else? Anything else? There's, we have a lot of little videos on the, um, the pillars of brain health on the Brain Health Initiative website. So pillars being nutrition and sleep, physical activity, social relationships, right? Um, uh, positive environments. They're all listed on the website. You can look more into them if you're interested in that. But they're key. It's amazing how much our environment uh, affects our brain. You know, and the little choices that we make every day really affect the way our brain develops. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Oh, I, I, um, I was I read recently, or I'm in the middle of reading a little by little. Um, you know Robert Sapolsky. He's a he's a neuroscientist that wrote a book called Behave. He talks a lot mm -hmm. about you know, very similar things. I don't know if you have any thoughts. If that's a a good researcher that you would recommend reading, or or if it's a, if that's somebody um, worth um, in, investigating. Yeah. What did you like about the book? Tell us about Behave. It just, it just talks about exactly the things that you're talking about. The neuro, the, how neurons are and how our brain developments and how we behave is a function of not just our brains, but also the, 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 the things we eat, but also the, the, the different development stages, um, the different, um, how do you say, um, uh, just the different uh, hormones in our bodies that, and, and children's bodies, how they develop over time and how that affects people's behaviors. And even as far as like the things that were interesting that he was that he was talking about in the book was talking even about uh sometimes the the decisions to make to make movements or to say things sometimes our our bodies move before our brains even like yeah. there's was, there was actually was very interesting even to th start thinking about the things that we do how much control we actually have over them which is an interesting thing to think about as well and there's yeah. i'm in the middle of the book but it's a it's a it's interesting no, it, it sounds great. I mean, it, um, I haven't read it. I have read some of his research, Sapolsky's research, and it was good research, um, but I haven't read the book yet. But I think you're, you're absolutely right. You just want to keep trying to learn more and think about what makes sense to you. Don't believe anything that any, everything that I said here tonight, don't believe. Me. Test it and see if it's true in your own life, because you're going to see this research coming out every day. There's five new junkie research studies that come out and the reported arm saying, Oh, believe this. Oh, believe this. And I'm like, oh my gosh. You look at the paper behind it and you're like, this does not convince me. Research is about a body of evidence. It's not about one study. You know, you need to be have a study after study after study after study that's supporting the same idea because it's easy 
to have research that is not very good research that tells you something is true. So always test it against your own intelligence, your own experience, and be a skeptical consumer of research. Okay, because it doesn't mean just because it's published doesn't mean it's good. Sometimes it's meta analysis, not just study by study. Yeah, and meta analysis are also very interesting. You can make really huge mistakes with meta analysis, <laughs> much bigger threat, or you can find really profound discoveries. You know, they're both possible. They're both really possible. So just always, always take your own counsel first, or speak with your friends and. and don't just don't just swallow anything, Brooklyn, especially what I'm saying. I mean, I went to school with Susan 25 years ago. <laughs> anything else coming up? No. Hi, Jenny. Hi. <laughs> well, thank I want to respect your time. I know it's we've been an hour in. So I'm grateful that you all made time to come here. Thank you. It was great to meet you and hear your thoughts. I appreciate it. And thank you, Susan, for having me. What a wonderful school community you have. You're so fortunate. Yeah, we, we certainly are. And we know that um, it's it's been a wonderful year. We still have another month and a week to go, a little bit longer than you have over in the States. Um, you have a wonderful community of children, um, of Montessori guides, parents, association Nemos is incredible um so you're a little part of our community now <laughs> yay i feel so lucky mm -hmm. what a great group <laughs> thank you very much Julia. thank you yeah. thank you for coming i hope it's helpful yes Thanks, so very good thank you, thank you for coming i see more children appearing yeah so fun yeah teach them about their brain they can they can handle it <laughs> it's almost time to go to bed, right? Yeah, and sleep matters. So get off the screen. <laughs> exactly. Did you hear, Louis? You need to sleep 12 hours. It's not what she said. Stay for dawn. This All right. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye bye. 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 Yeah. Bye. No <laughs> <laughs> fun. Good night, Marie. Bye. Good night. See you Thursday. What a great group. Thank you.